I hope that you'll turn with me in an open Bible as we look together at 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And our focus today will be on verses 1 to 12. It's Valentine's Day. It's a day where we see many hearts, red hearts, sometimes inflated into balloons, sometimes shaped into chocolate boxes or other candies. It's a day of red hearts, right? Well, as God's providence would have it, the scripture is about hearts. Yes, hearts. But of course, the hearts described in God's word are not Valentine's Day hearts. They pertain to something far deeper. When the scriptures speak of our heart, they're not speaking primarily of our romantic feelings. The heart represents the seat of who you are, the center of who you are, what you treasure and value and love above all. That's your heart. And the hearts that we see here are not hearts inflated with romantic love. They are stolen hearts. Stolen hearts. Hearts that are seduced and deceived and entrapped. And it's a trap that lies waiting for every single one of us. Your heart, right now, and my heart, is in danger of being ensnared in the exact same way. And so this scripture has immediate applicability to every single one of us. Your heart is in danger of being stolen today. We need to acknowledge that so that we can avoid this trap. What we see unfolding is King David's son Absalom, a celebrity in Israel, manages to turn King David's kingdom upside down. This is not a story that we hear often when we think of King David or hear about King David. We tend to hear about David and Goliath, maybe that incident with Bathsheba, but it's kind of happily ever after there, right? When in reality, David's kingdom is torn apart, ripped apart by civil war, not from an external enemy, but from his very own son, Absalom, someone with whom he shared bread. That's where the betrayal comes. And so we need to ask the question, how is it that Absalom manages to come back? He's he's been estranged from his father. David reluctantly lets him come back home. How is it that Absalom manages to pull this off? Well, he does it by going straight for the human heart, straight for the heart. And so what we need to remember here is that the human heart, your heart and my heart, is easily seduced by the trap of trying to satisfy spiritual cravings, spiritual longings with earthly cures. Your heart was designed by God, your creator, with spiritual longings and cravings and desires. But because of the corruption of sin, our hearts are so easily seduced by what looks good, what seems good right now. Never mind the long-term consequences. Never mind what God says about that. We're drawn to that and we're seduced by that. And so the only way to avoid that trap 
the trap that lies in waiting for your heart and my heart is to embrace the heart-changing lordship, the heart-changing lordship of the one whose love is better than life. Surrender to him. Submit to him. This one who has proven his love for sinners like you and like me in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the way to avoid the trap. But we need to know what the trap is and we need to know just how dangerous and how seductive this trap is for your heart and mine. So let's read together beginning at verse 1. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case would come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So how did Absalom pull this off? Well, he prayed on what our hearts crave. And in these verses, we see that the heart, your heart, my heart, craves affirmation. We crave affirmation. We want someone to affirm us, to tell us just how worthy we are, just how good we are. And how does he do that? Well, first he focuses on his appearance. We were told in the prior chapter that he already had a celebrity status. He was good looking, had great hair, and all the people admired him. Well, now he adds to that a chariot and horses with 50 men to run ahead of him. Now for us, we say, what's, what's so special about that? Well, in this day and time, we have to picture this as kind of like a presidential motorcade right, with lots of black SUVs in line with flashing lights, lots of secret service agents in black suits with earpieces. That's the kind of image that Absalom is trying to establish for himself. He wants to not only be important, he wants to look important. He wants people to see him and to respect him and think, oh, here comes a celebrity. Here comes somebody who has power. Here comes someone who has influence. That's what he wants people to see. But in the scriptures, we're often told about how chariots are not something that people should put their trust in. Back when Israel was clamoring for a king, and they wanted a king like the nations, they wanted someone who would be a great general for them, someone who had power and knew how to wield it. The prophet Samuel warned them in 1 Samuel 8, verse 11. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Well, that's exactly what Absalom's doing, right? He is exactly the kind of king that the people wanted. He's like the kings of the nations. And of course, our Lord taught us that power looks very different in his kingdom. He says, the Gentiles, 
take the, the seats of influence and power and they lord it over. But it's not to be that way with you. Now, we hear Jesus say that, and yet, don't you see how seductive this is? Oh, here's somebody who's important. Here's someone who can really fix the world. Here's someone who deserves my vote, right? Well, it's not only his appearance. So he goes early to the side of the road leading to the city gate, and the city gate back then was a place where people would go to have their claims heard. This is where they would seek justice. This is like the county courthouse of this day and time. So he goes out there early to intercept anyone who's coming to King David to seek justice. And what does he do? He would show a personal interest in them. Where are you from? What town are you from? Don't we love it when someone shows a personal interest in us? When someone remembers our name, right? Remembers our birthday, Oh, we like that. That feels good. Well, that's what he does. Where are you from? He, he postures himself as someone who really cares about these people. And having heard where they're from, then he provides validation. He says, your claims are valid and proper. <laughs> but don't you know some of those claims weren't valid and proper? Are we really supposed to believe that everyone who came to the gate had a valid and proper claim? No, of course not. But that's what he tells them, because that's what they want to hear, right? We like the affirmation, yes, tell me I'm right in the way I think. Yes, confirm my bias. That's what I want. And if you don't tell me that, then I'll find someone who will. And by the way, we need to be aware that this, in Absalom, we can see how most politicians function. And to some extent, they have to in a republic, in a democracy. They, they're trying to earn your vote. That's what they're supposed to do. And we're grateful for government. We're grateful for good government. We're grateful for politicians who stand on principle. But just know that it is rare, rare indeed, for a politician to tell you you're wrong in the way you're thinking. It's rare for a politician to tell a constituent, you need to change the way you're looking at this, right? What we like is for a politician to say, look, I'm going to lower your taxes, I'm going to raise entitlements, and I'm going to balance the budget, right? <laughs> Doesn't that feel good? Do the impossible. But, and that's what he says. Oh, you're, you're valid and proper in everything that you're claiming. Then... He creates discontent and alienation with the current administration, with David's kingdom, his father. You know, it's, it's too bad there's nobody here from David who could hear your case. It's really a shame. But you know, if I were made judge in Israel, I could make sure you had justice every time. I would render you a good verdict every time. Wouldn't that be nice? But too bad. That's not the way it is now, right? I just don't have that authority. Then, when people want to bow down to him, then he shows false humility. They want to bow down. They want to show deference like you would show to a king. And as soon as they do that, he, he embraces them and kisses them. So that he's saying, oh, I'm not worthy for you to bow down to me. I'm not a king or anything. But, oh, let me, let me embrace you to show you how much I care for you. And in this way, he stole the hearts of the people. We crave affirmation, do we not? I do. You do. We want this. And what we need to be aware of is, is that we need something more than affirmation. What we need is for someone to tell us the truth. And it is in telling us the truth that real affirmation comes. And the God who has made himself known to us 
in the Lord Jesus Christ is a God who will always tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. And so you and I have got to be alert to this seduction so that we don't fall into this trap. Our heart longs for affirmation. It's just the affirmation that you really need and the affirmation that I really need can only come from God telling you the truth about yourself. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. And it's not just that I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. It's that I am completely unable to do anything that would earn God's righteous favor. And so are you. That is human depravity. And that's the truth about ourselves. And there is only one hope. There is only one way for us to be saved. And that's by the grace of God. And sadly... That's not what we hear very often. More often what we hear is, you're enough. You're totally sufficient and of yourself. You don't need to change a thing. You're perfect just the way you are. Oh, and that strokes our ego, doesn't it? That feels good. Yes, affirm me. I want you to know that I will always do my best to tell you the truth about yourself based on the Word of God, not my opinion. You don't need my opinion on anything. But based on what the Word of God says to you and about you, I will always strive to tell you the truth. And in your personal life, make sure that you are alert to this trap so that you surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth about yourself. People who don't just stroke your ego People who don't just give you the affirmation that you crave. Because those are the people who are actually going to lead you closer to the only one who can fully satisfy your heart. The Lord God Almighty, whose love is better than life itself. Well, it doesn't stop there. He continues and he even deceives his father, David. So we pick up our reading at verse 7. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. While your servant was living at Geshur in Aram, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he went to Hebron. So now that Absalom has stolen the hearts of the people, he does this for four years, then he brings religion, he brings God into play. And he goes to his father David and he says, Dad, I need to go to Hebron. See, I made this vow to God that if God ever brought me home to Jerusalem, I would go back to Hebron, which is his hometown, by the way. That's where, where Absalom was born, and I would offer a sacrifice there. That's what he says. And David completely goes along with it. Go in peace. And ironically, these are the last words recorded that they will exchange between one another. Go in peace. When, of course, peace is the last thing that Absalom has on his mind. So why does he want to go to Hebron? Well, Hebron was the capital city. It was the main city in the tribe of Judah. This is, in fact, where David was proclaimed king. And so probably Absalom is trying to usurp David's role by going to the city where David was crowned. And coronated so that he can be king, right? That's what he wants to do. But notice how he brings God in. He brings God in. And he lies. He didn't make any vow. That's not why he wants to go to Hebron. He doesn't want to go worship. He doesn't care about God. God is the last thing on his mind. 
But oh, how he dupes David and he deceives the people. And what you need to know is that the heart craves religion. The heart craves religion. You may say, well, that's an odd claim. I mean, if that were true, wouldn't we expect to see more people in church? Where is everybody if all these people really crave religion? Well, we need to expand our understanding of what religion is. Religion is any attempt to try to find ultimate meaning and significance and to satisfy whatever that ultimate significance is, whether it's God, whether it's a philosophy, whether it's a worldview, whatever it is, whatever is of ultimate significance to you, religion is a means to find that. And for some people, of course, church, Christianity is a means to do that. For other people, it's a different worldview. But that human desire, that human craving for religion, for a tradition, for order, for something that can bring us into harmony with the universe or whatever higher power you happen to believe in, we all crave that. And it's important to note we crave that whether God is involved or not. And we've seen time and time again in this book how people will use God. They will use religion for their own personal profit. Right? And this is true for all of us. We, can, we want to be able to say, I went to church I didn't fall asleep during the sermon. I sang all the songs. I can say a public prayer when called upon. I serve on this committee. I've gone on this mission trip. We all want those things because it satisfies that religious craving, whether God is involved or not. And you need to be aware of this deception that so often we can use religion to make us feel good about ourselves when we're no closer to God than we were when we came to church. You aware of that? Is your heart in it or not? Are you speaking truthfully or not? Absalom doesn't really care about God. He just wants to use God. Beware of people who just want to use God to get your vote, to get your allegiance, to get your support. They will do it. Why? Because the human heart craves religion. Oh, this is, a, this is an upstanding person. I mean, he, he talks about God. He quotes the Bible. <laughs> oh, yes. He quotes the Bible, so surely this person, surely this person is someone we should vote for or listen to, right? Don't be deceived. Don't fall for that trap. We continue reading in verse 10. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. So next, Absalom makes a couple of shrewd moves. He sends secret messengers. He says, when the time is right, proclaim to everybody, now is the time. Absalom's king. And he manages to deceive 200 of David's counselors to go with him. They don't know what's going on, but he has deprived David of some of his best advice by deceiving them. And we have a Judas-type figure, Ahithophel, David's counselor who has been seduced as well by Absalom's plot. His heart has been stolen by Absalom. And so they all come to Hebron, and we're told that the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. Here's what you need to remember. Absalom is successful. This works. It may seem obvious, But this works. And it points out the fact that the human heart, your heart and my heart, craves success. 
We want things that work. We are all, to some extent, pragmatists. What works? What is effective? What gets people's attention? Well, well this works. The conspiracy is gaining strength. He's getting more and more followers. This is huge. He's going to be successful, by the way. Spoiler alert. He's going to kick David off the throne. God's anointed king. God's chosen king through whom God chose to reveal his heart. Absalom is going to kick him off the throne. He will be successful. And Surely anything that's successful, anything that gathers that many people, has to be right. No? <laughs> no. Don't be seduced into the trap of pragmatism. Don't just ask, does it work? Don't just ask, is it successful? Ask, is it true? Is it right? Or not? And if the world considers you a failure because you acted in obedience to what God told you to do, if you were faithful to his word, even when you're the only person in the room who was, well, is God's affirmation enough for you? We can never get over the fact that the man we worship, the man we follow, the man whom Christians proclaim as Lord, was a total failure in the eyes of the world at the age of 33. He ended up crucified, publicly executed, a criminal. I mean, does that work? Well, by all appearances, no, it doesn't. And yet, he is Lord, crucified, and we believe risen, Lord of life. And so be aware that your heart and my heart is drawn to someone like Absalom. Oh, this is successful. This gets the people to come. And this applies in, in your business world. This applies in the church. We want what works, right? Not so fast. It's good to be effective. We want to be effective. But the more important question is, is it right? Is it true? Never mind what the world says. So is there any rescue from this trap? What you and I need is a total heart transplant. Because as long as we have an unrepentant heart, a heart unchanged by the grace of God, we will be a sucker to every single one of these seductions. But by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, you can be born again. You can have a new heart. A new heart whose loves and whose priorities are shaped not by the flesh, not by this world, but by the God who has made Himself known in the Lord Jesus Christ. And His love is better than life. Is your heart convinced that is really true? No, no matter what happens to you in your life, no matter how much adversity, no matter how much hardship you face, you know and you believe and your heart is convinced his love is enough. And I'm not going to try to satisfy my spiritual cravings with any earthly cure. I know that only his love made available through the Lord Jesus Christ is enough to satisfy my heart. Is that enough for your heart? Has your heart been reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit? If not, all you have to say is, Jesus is Lord. Give your life to Him. Say, God, yes. On my own, I'm going to follow Absalom all day long. But I don't want to be a sucker for that anymore. 
God, remake me. And if you say, yes, yes, I believe his love is enough. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Be aware that these, this trap is still dangerous. Be alert. Beware. And heed these words found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. This is the remedy. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put to death this earthly craving for affirmation. Put to death this earthly craving for religion that just goes through the motions without putting your heart in it, without wanting to enjoy God himself, not just what you can get from God. Put to death your craving for worldly success. Set your hearts on things above where Christ Jesus is. Amen? Set your heart on things above. Don't fall for the trap. Don't get stuck. Look up. Look up. May we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we confess that we are so easily ensnared that our hearts are so easily drawn to what sparkles, to what glimmers, to what is flashy, to what is big. Lord, we confess that to you. Fix our eyes by your Holy Spirit working in us on our lowly and gentle Savior, our crucified and risen Lord. And when we find ourselves stuck, we find ourselves feeling hopeless. Help us to lift our eyes up to where Christ is, where he reigns as our sovereign Lord, and from which place he will return to this earth to finish what he began. Until that day, help us to live with faithfulness and with patience, and help us to be guided always by your truth. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.